Good afternoon. It's 3.30 by my watch, and it's based on GPS satellite, so it's got to be 3.30. Welcome. How's everybody's Gurkhan so far? Awesome. Awesome? Good. Um, out of curiosity, uh, how many people were at my talk here two years ago by any chance? A couple? Good, good. I'm not repeating a whole lot, but I will fill in a couple gaps for all of the new people here. Um, my name is Jeff Mann. Uh, I'm giving a talk, More Tales from the Crypt, dot, 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 analyst. Um, pretty much the purpose of the talk today is what I did at NSA in my final couple years, which was uh, help to form the first penetration testing red team that NSA had. So that's what you have to look forward to. I need to start with an apology. Um, when I started doing this stuff about 25 years ago, um, there weren't a whole lot of screenshot <laughs> uh, apps. Uh, so I really struggled to find meaningful pictures and illustrations to help illustrate. So sometimes you might have to use your imagination. Uh, technologies come a long way. Um, I also want to try to make this a little bit in interactive and a little bit uh, informative and instructional. And uh, I am going to ask for audience partic participation. Uh, primarily, I'm going to uh, occasionally throughout the talk, and I sure hope I can get through all my slides. Uh, I'm going to be very fast paced today, hopefully. Uh, but I'm going to share some dates in history, and I want you guys to tell me what's important about the date. For example, anybody know what's important about this date? Shout it out if you know it or want to guess. Three, two, one, give up. And that technically happened after I left the NSA. So it has nothing to do with my talk other than it's fun. Um, I was at NSA for about 10 years from 1986 through 1996. Uh, while I was there, I did a couple different things, roughly broke into three different uh, jobs, if you will, three different assignments. I did cryptography, I designed crypto systems, I did uh, cryptanalysis, I broke crypto systems, I did information security analysis, um, and ultimately ended up doing uh, penetration testing. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just a real quick recap, if you want to hear more details about what I did, NSA version one, my first tour. Uh, there's a recording of my talk from two years ago at Gurkhan called Tales from the Crypt Analyst. Uh, but just a real quick recap, sort of the highlight of my first three years at, at uh, NSA was uh, I worked in the manual crypto system shop. We, we dealt with paper products, primarily one-time pads. And that was in the very beginning when people were starting to get desktop computers. We had a customer that said, is there any way we can use that computer to do this manual, manually laborious task of encrypting and decrypting messages? And we're like, sure, that seems reasonable. So uh, I was uh, the project manager, developed a system where uh, basically wrote a computer program that would do the encryption and the decryption, a very simple algorithm. But the, the biggest thing that was the one-time pad, which is the key, was produced on a floppy disk. Um, that was done at a time at NSA where, when NSA, all they did was build little black boxes. Uh, had a chief scientist at the time say to me, uh, well, said to a group, and I overheard him, there's really no such thing as software here at NSA. It's all firmware. Um, I had to go through a, uh, a design process. Uh, I had to follow a whole bunch of uh, rules. Uh, in terms of building a product. Um, I happen to have a lot of free time, so I drew this on a, some early graphic something or other with the computer. Up there it talks about FSRS. That's Functional Security Requirement spec Specifications. Written for hardware, I had to follow them. So I basically had to rewrite them in, in terms of a context of a software application. Um, begrudgingly, I was able to do it. I had this fun little cartoon up in my cubicle for years. Uh, the point is, it had never been done before, I had to rewrite the rules, and my boss, uh, uh, who gave me an award after I got a cash award of like 500 bucks for doing this thing, and that's him presenting, that's me younger with hair, and I used to have to wear a suit. Um, but he said at one point uh, t about me that I'm a loose cannon, and looking back on it, I kind of took that as a badge of honor. 
Um, so that's version one. Uh, uh, version two of my NSA career, I, I went over to the operations side of the house. I became a cryptanalysis intern, so that's where we started. I was on the side where we actually broke codes and intercepted communications. Highlights of that was uh, I went down the road uh, to Fort Meade proper. That's the little area photo. Uh, it was a big deal when they put a sign out on the highway outside of Fort Meade saying this is the exit for NSA because when I was hired and for many years, you didn't say that you worked at NSA. You weren't allowed to. And it was rather, I grew up in Maryland. I never knew it existed. It was very, very low key. Um, highlights of version two is I was, I was on the op side of the house uh, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, our first little skirmish in, in the Middle East. Um, and I, I was working towards being professionalized, my one certification that I have, which is as a, as a cryptanalyst. But on to the fun stuff, version three. Uh, my final tour uh, as a, as a crypto, crypto, cryptanalysis intern, I'm going to try not to say that again, was back on the info side, infosec side of the house, the defensive side of the house in an organization called Fielded Systems Evaluations. And the concept was pretty simple. Uh, NSA had made a, uh, its living off of you know, reading our enemies and other countries' uh, communications and signals and traffics and messages. And very often the way we are able to do that, we're able to do that, was because the people that were using the systems uh, didn't use them properly. They didn't change default settings. They, did, they used key more often than they should. You know, a one-time pad is the most secure system in the world if you use it once. If you think, well, let's save paper and use the same key for 30 days instead of one day, you start introducing problems and that makes it so that the systems can be solved. Um, people wouldn't change default passwords, default settings. Any of this sound familiar? It's weird how that kind of stuff works. but. Uh, one of the branches within this division uh, was focused on at the time what was called network systems. And back then it was mostly mainframes that were talking basically over phone lines. And uh, if you think back of the movie War Games, which actually came out in 1983, which was a full 10 years before I'm getting started in NSA doing this stuff, uh, that, that's kind of what hacking was back then. Um, but we were looking at the systems that we had built, that NSA had built, and, and how they were implemented and used in the field because we figured, well, gee, if all of our enemies misuse systems and we produce the best systems in the world in the laboratory and we set up, you know, this is how you use it securely and this is how you use it, to, you know, in its best manner, how do we know that the 18, 19-year-old radio operator out in the field hasn't found a shortcut, hasn't found a way to bypass some of the crypto or bypass some of the security? So we were involved in looking at how things were uh, being used, being implemented in the field, because lo and behold, uh, things tend to fall apart if they're implemented improperly. Again, that should sound familiar to you guys. Um, very early on when I was in this office, uh, something happened that changed the world. So here's another one of those dates. Anyone have a guess? What, say? <laughs> I don't have time for people to Google. Yes, take a guess. Uh, no, but that was probably, that was uh, a little bit later. But no, I don't have time for you to guess long. I'll have to tell you what it is. Wasn't the first browser, but Mosaic came out, and I actually found this is kind of what it looked like. Uh, you know, the first web browser that kind of became mainstream and, and gave people all over the world the idea that, hey, there's this thing called the Internet, and it can connect everyone, and everybody can communicate and share information freely, and it'll be wonderful, and, and, and life as we know it changed. And here we are today. Um, so very quickly after that happened, and we started taking notice of, you know, there's more stuff going on on the internet. There's more things that are getting interconnected that formerly were not connected. Uh, very immediately, the idea was, well, how do we protect things? And um, I actually have these props. I wanted you to note from the titles that back in the day, it was all about internet security. How to be secure if you're attaching to the internet. 
I have these books. These were the Bibles of the day. These were the first books written about all this stuff that we're doing here today. This was written by a guy named Gene Spafford, prof, uh, professor at Purdue. Um, he's still around. We'll get back to him. Um, this book was written by Cheswick and Bellavin, two guys that were researchers. All these early people were researchers in universities because that's who had the computers that were connected. Um, this happens to be an autographed first edition copy, and um, Bellavin actually wrote to me in cipher. It's either ROT1 or ROT25. You can help me figure that out, Dave. Um, you guys are welcome afterwards. I'll have these out if you want to look at them. Um, again, my point is, in the early days, we called it internet security. And this very quickly got the attention and the interest of people that I worked with in this office. Hey, network systems, internet, let's learn how to hack. Um, so we put a team together. And it was basically people that had interests and likes and were kind of curious. and. Some of us were loose cannons, and we wanted to sort of buck the rules and do things that had never been done before. Um, the deputy director at the time, he had a vision. And his vision was simply more or less along these lines. All we need is a bunch of people, these smart young hacker types, you know, with long hair and living alternative lifestyles and, you know, have no skin color because they live in closets and basements, you know, just so, you know, they were younger, so they you know, hadn't gained weight from all the years spending in their bedroom, so they weren't 600 pounds yet. But he had this idea of putting all these people together. Well, NSA has, has and had a lot of smart people, and, and what government agencies often do is they go through a reorganization. So they put together a, a center of excellence, which took a few of us of these young hacker kids. There was only you know, half a dozen of us or so at the time. At least they got pulled into this group. And we, we launched this thing called the Systems and Network Attack Center, or the SNAC. Uh, if you Google the SNAC today, uh, you can find uh, documentation that they've published over the years, like how to harden Windows NT and stuff like that. Uh, it goes way back. Um, we always thought it was kind of cool. Our, or, our organization designation was C4, so we felt like we were explosive. Um, but our mission was basically to be a center of excellence. The, the management at the time, you know, we've got a lot of smart people at NSA, and we can beat the world at all this. We can be the first ones to discover vulnerabilities. We can be the first ones to discover how to harden things and what are the proper configurations, and we'll rock. And we were like, yeah, we're, there's only a few of us, and there's the whole world out there. Um, but that was the belief of management at the time. So. Had this small group of guys that were together. We had been part of a branch, and we got pulled together into this new thing called the Snack. And uh, we, d we wanted to learn. We wanted to learn the hacker mentality, hacker culture. We wanted to learn how to do things and, and, and become good hackers. Good at, we wanted to learn. We wanted to, to be good at what we did. Uh, so we took a road trip. At the time, in those days, I don't know if it's still true or not, but the, the, the networks that existed in the military were, were owned and operated by the Air Force. And the Air Force had opened up uh, an organization called the Air Force Information Warfare Center, which was down in San Antonio, Texas. Um, in putting this talk together, I actually was fortunate enough to, to uh, talk to a couple people that I had met 23 years ago when we took this road trip down to AFWIC to learn what they were doing, because they were basically the first uh, security operations center. They were monitoring the networks. They were, um, the Air Force had their own CERT, you know, their own uh, organization that was putting out vulnerability notifications or notifications of attacks and breaches. So we went to learn. We met these two guys. They're both Air Force cap captains. The one on your left, uh, Kevin Zeiss, he actually just passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, but he of a, a pioneer and founder in, in this industry. Uh, the person on the right, also an Air Force Captain, Scott Waddell, he's kicking. I was on the phone with him uh, last week. We probably spent about two hours. We hadn't talked in 20 some odd years. And we were just kind of kicking, kicking it old school and talking about the good old days and how, how all this stuff got started. Um, these guys, and, and this is sort of uh, old school version two, they went on with a bunch of their friends who all mostly came out of the Air Force and, and a, an organization that was a contractor to the Air Force Information Warfare Center. They formed one of the first uh, commercial security companies called the Wheel Group. Anybody ever hear of the Wheel Group? One or two people. 
Uh, this is why we teach history as old timers, because we think it's important. Uh, the Wheel Group, uh, they had a product called Net Ranger, which was one of the first commercial uh, intrusion detection tools. Uh, back in those days, companies would start and very quickly get snatched up by bigger companies. So these guys, uh, after only about maybe 11 or 12 or 13 months, they were acquired by Cisco. Some of the guys that were the originally in the wheel group, they still work at Cisco. So others have moved on. I kind of, I kind of picked on Scott a little bit. I said, you know, all those, all you guys that back in the early days started companies, got acquired, you know, had your big, you know, uh, payout. You're still working. Why is that? Um, anyway, San Antonio. This was sort of the beginning for us in terms of formalizing what we were doing. We were there to learn. Uh, anybody ever been to San Antonio? Uh, Kelly Air Force Base. I'm not even sure if it's still open. They had a they had an museum, museum, and we got to see an SR-71, which had only been declassified like in the last couple years prior to when we were there in 1995. So that was cool. Uh, we saw this. this is, anybody know what plane this is? The A-10 Warthog. It it was what won Desert Shield Desert Storm for us. It was, it was very uh, essential in that war. Um, those guys right there are actually, with myself, the original members of what came to be no, known as the pit. Uh, and none of them do I have their permission to say who they are. And I'm hoping that you won't be able to recognize any of them, because I pretty much don't recognize them at this point. Um, but, you know, San Antonio, we got to see the Alamo. Uh, we ended up on the Riverwalk, and we were introduced to the 46-ounce margarita which I highly recommend if you're going to have a career as a hacker uh, to have 46 ounce margaritas at some point. Um, that was important to us because in building our hacker culture, and one of our takeaways uh, from Athwick was uh, we rearranged our office. And it, it may seem silly now, but we were in cubicle land where everybody had their own little space that was not OSHA compliant. We didn't have enough square footage of what we were supposed to have. And everybody just kind of faced each other and themselves. And uh, we learned at AFWIC that they sort of had this open concept and they had a round table. It took me a long time to find a picture of an office space with a round table. And that's sort of what I came up with. But we did that. So we were all in the perimeter and we had a table in the middle that was round. And whenever we had a problem that any of us was working on, any of us could a round table. And we would all have to stop what we were doing, spin our chairs around, come to the table, and we would, you know, talk it out. You know, we were, we were all learning. We were all trying to learn from each other, and, and we all had something to contribute and share. So just from an organizational perspective, the round table was a thing, a very important thing for us. And we had brought back a glass uh, that had held a 46-ounce margarita, and that sat in the middle of our round table. And it was actually filled by a bunch, you know, maybe 100, 150 little rubber balls, you know, you know the bouncy balls. And every once in a while, if we had to let off steam, everybody would just start winging uh, power balls, super balls at each other, because that's how hackers rolled back then. We thought it was cool because we were government employees. Um, we developed a methodology. There was no pen testing methodology back then, at least not formally written down. Uh, so we, we started to come up with, how are we going to do all this stuff? And uh, we had, because we were NSA, we had all sorts of ground rules that we had to follow. And the ground rules were, existed for reasons, and it had a lot to do with the law and, and what NSA is allowed to do and what NSA is not allowed to do. Um, but the upshot of all these rules was if we wanted to, to do an assessment, if we had a customer, if we had some organization or group that th they wanted us to do our thing, we had to go through all sorts of permissions, which would take literally weeks. And we weren't allowed to do anything until these permissions had been granted. Of course, nobody was monitoring back then, so we usually did all this stuff first and, you know, as a proof of concept. And we would write up our attack strategy and then wait the month to get the permission. And it was magic how quickly it happened. Um, but we, we also came up with a methodology. And I, I you know, pen testing is pen testing. I don't think this has changed a whole lot. We call things slightly different terms these days. But, you know, you start by trying to figure out what your target is. You try to learn about your target, both, you know, at a technical level, but also at a human level, at an organizational level. 
you plan, you figure out what you've got to work with, you, 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 know, you probe the networks, you probe the, probe the targets, you find the weaknesses, the holes, and you go after them and you try to attack them and then you write up what you did. Not a whole lot different from what exists today and of course you can spend thousands of dollars and go to courses and learn all this stuff and there's books that have been written about it. Um, and you know, this is not magical, we weren't the first ones to come up with it. You know, people that were pen testing and hacking in those days, we all sort of gravitated to this is how you do it. You know, we just happened to be first at NSA doing it. Um, I could easily, and I struggle with this, I could easily make this a talk about how did we do hacking back in the day, 25 years ago. And I might do that as a talk sometime, but I'm trying not to, I'm trying to focus more on the stories and, and, and sort of the history of how this all happened and not so much the technical aspects. But if you guys want it, you know, let me know and I'll try to put that together. Um, but to try to put this in context, and this is a short list, but these are the types of things that we didn't have in terms of tools and things to use back then. Things that are pretty much standard and part of the, the standard pen testers toolkit today pretty much didn't exist back then. What did we have? So let's talk a little bit about tradecraft. And we didn't call it tradecraft back then, we called it tools and exploits, and we had a toolkit. And, and now's where the, it gets a little bit potentially sensitive. Um, and this is one of those bureaucratic legal things with NSA. But when we were doing what we were doing, our customers were uh, mostly the military and anybody that had a classified network. And the rule was anything that we did in terms of testing, assessing a classified network, any of our activities had to be classified at the same level as our target, as the network we were going after. So if we were looking at a top secret network that, that processed top secret data, everything that we did was labeled top secret. So technically what I'm about to go over probably is classified somewhere still to this day as top secret. So what I'm going to try to avoid doing is saying that we used any of these particular techniques. What I will say to you is these are things that were readily available back in the day. And they were pretty much, most of them, as you'll see, were pretty much open source, which was one of our frustrations. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But this is kind of what we could have used if we were doing this kind of stuff against a particular part target. Everybody with me? That's my disclaimer. Um, we had network sniffers back then. They were machines. They were built by companies like Hewlett Packard. They were on carts. And we would put them around and plug them into like routers uh, and, 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 and monitor networks that way. Um, we did have something called Satan, which was one of the first vulnerability scanners, and we didn't even really call it a vulnerability scanner back then, um, but that existed. Another one of these dates for you. Anyone have a guess? Probably not. I'll, I'll, I'll end the suspense. Anybody ever hear of bug track? Anybody know what bug track is? You're about to learn. Um, it was created in 1993. It was taken over by someone named Aleph One in 1996. And what it was was basically a, a mailing list, a digest, where people could write in, in and report vulnerabilities. It was sort of a vulnerability notification, but it was sort of a, a common place for everybody to go to look. Oh, I'm using a such and such, or I'm using this operating system, system or I'm using this application. You could go to bug track and search and see if anybody had found vulnerabilities or bugs with the particular thing you were looking at. It was also an early notification for anything that we were using. So it became a common source of information of you know, what's going on in the world, what are people breaking into, what are people discovering in terms of vulnerability. We also had cert advisories. I mentioned Af Air Force certs earlier, but there was there was there are several different cert groups. Here's one that came out in 1996. And if you're reading it, you should start chuckling pretty soon. We had a sense of humor back then. At least the cert did. that cert was issued during the release of the movie Independence Day, and it's all about the alien virus that uh, that took over the Earth. A little bit of humor back then. You were supposed to laugh more. Um, real quick examples of open source. You know, we we had uh, you know FAQs that we could find online. We had search queries for things like the Archie database. Uh, we had to like look up 
you know, what systems were based on their registration, their domain registration. Um, so there was primitive tools that could do that. Um, Gopher was another uh, sort of a digest that would, that would catalog the databases that were interconnected, all these different mainframes are out there. Um, one of the very first uh, search engines was a, a tool called AltaVista. Uh, it was my favorite at the time. Um, Netscape browser came along. So we had the begin, began to have the ability to search for people online. And over time, more and more people were adding more and more data and information. Uh, they were digitizing it, so it became available in these search engines. And, and Yahoo was actually one of the early popular uh, search engines. So you could start, you know, what we would call open source intelligence today. You could check out companies. You could check out uh, people, you know, if you could find them. I mean, back in those days, you didn't necessarily know who worked for a particular company or organization that might be your target. Uh, you didn't necessarily know what their email address is, which was their user ID, might use to try to break into a network by stealing credentials or guessing credentials. These were all things that were, you know, we take for granted these days. We can go to LinkedIn and find 10,000 employees at a company, and all their email addresses are alias, so we can pretty much figure out what their names are and what the permutations are and pretty quickly guess their usernames. Not so back in those days. Um, we had primitive tools for, for once we had targets, you know, probing networks, probing all the ports. Uh, a popular tool was one called Strobe. Uh, again, we had to look up who owns this particular IP address. There, there was no private addressing back then. Uh, if you were on the internet, you had a routable IP address, even if you were behind the firewall. So if you're going after a company, that company would own some segment of the network space. They would have some sort of domain. They would own a Class C or several Class Cs or a portion of a Class C network. Does anybody know what a Class C network is? No, we don't care about that. Well, I'm good. I'm glad a lot of you people know it, but we don't really care about that these days. Um, you know, NS lookup was a was a popular command for that existed back in the Unix. Although technically Linux wasn't around, uh, well, we didn't use it a whole lot back in the early days. Uh, we had primitive uh, network mapping tools, so we could figure out what all the systems were on a network and get some idea of what the, the hierarchy was in, in a network. Another date. Um, I'll cut to the chase. This is the uh, date that Crack was released. Anybody ever heard of Crack? Uh, the password guessing tool. Let <laughs> me qualify that. Uh, one of the first, one of the early ones, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, passwords existed in the Etsy password file. We were all, everything was Unix-based systems back then, pretty much. There were no shadow fat password files, or they were very rarely used. So if you could get to the password file, you had all the hashes, and then you could run crack, and there was other, perm, you know, other pack password cracking tools available. Crack was one of the early ones. Um, don't memorize any of those names because that's a real password list from probably 20 some years ago. Um, and, and sort of a final example, uh, very common in the Unix days in a way that we elevated privileges, the way we got root back in those days was finding something called a, a set UID script. So set UID basically means the program is running at the level of the owner of the program in a lot of a lot of Unix system files, a lot, of, a lot of Unix applications, a lot of Unix function calls back in the early days were owned by root. And if they had the set UID bit set, it means they were running as root. Even, you, know, you might execute it as a regular user, but when you execute, executed that program or that function, it was running as root. And so the trick was if you could get it to crash, if you could get it to uh, halt its, it, you know, interrupt its functionality, it would very often crap out and leave you running, you know, if you could get it to launch a shell, it would be running as the owner of the application, which was root. That's very often how we got root, or we would have if we were using something like this on any of our targets. Um, at some point, we, we got together, you know, when the snack was formed, and we, we, we created our own space. And it was essentially we had our own office together. Thank you. Um, we were located, uh, this, is in Fort, this is in Maryland near uh, BWI Airport. Has anybody ever been to BWI Airport? 
This is right outside a whole complex of buildings that have fences around them. If they have fences around them, chances are they're NSA. Um, this one building in particular was called Phoenix 3, and the arrow points to a, the, roughly the corner of the building where we had our office. Um, the reason why this has sort of uh, become famous is there was a book that, that came out a couple years ago called Dark Territory. Ever, anybody ever seen the book, read the book, heard of the book? Sort of recommended. It's mostly true. Uh, in that book, there's a chapter called Eligible Receiver. In that chapter, there's a paragraph. I'll do a dramatic reading quickly. The NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of the Information Assurance Directory, blah, 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 blah. The defensive side of NSA stationed in Phoenix, blah, blah, blah. During its most sensitive drills, the Red Team worked out of a chamber called the Pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed. Uh, so that's the folklore that, that grew out of this office that we nicknamed the pit because we were trying to be cool and, and edgy and different. And if anybody ever remembers the show MASH, the, the, the doctors in MASH, the, the tent where they lived was called the swamp. So the pit just became a variation of we need to come up with a name for our space. So we called it the pit. And somewhere between then and now that turned into folklore and we were written about in a book. Um, the pit was really uh, just a group of what, what ended up being six guys. Oh, it worked. We used to have this on our laptops, and so when we'd go to a client site, we'd open it up and start playing this. I don't know if it ends up on the recording, but I'll turn that off now. I've never done sound in a PowerPoint before. I'm, I'm kind of stoked. Um, <laughs> There's six of us. Two of us, as the, the moniker suggests, still work at NSA. Uh, two wish to, be, wish to remain anonymous, and they're out in the private sector. It's myself and the last guy there, Ron Gula. He was the founder of Tenable. Uh, so that's, that's the pit, six guys. Um, we had issues uh, doing pen testing at NSA. I alluded to it earlier. Um, the mission, and I couldn't find an old version of the mission, and information assurance is what our group came to be known as after I left. Um, but essentially, the defensive side of the house when I was there was building secure crypto systems. We, we, we supplied crypto and secure communications for the military and for the government at, at any level that involved classified information. So it was a lot. And we were kind of a one-stop shop. Um, when things started happening in the early 90s, when technology started advancing, when, um, you know, when there became this thing called public key cryptography, uh, NSA started going through, a, at least the InfoSec side of the house, started having a little bit of an identity crisis. Um, they, they, they started experiencing competition because there, there were now available cheaper and more diverse ways of doing cryptography where you didn't have to go to NSA necessarily, even though that was the tradition. So NSA as an organization, as a business, they kind of struggled with uh, dealing with uh, competition at, at one level. Uh, another important date, that was the date the PGP was released. Um, if you were around back then, PGP and the guy that wrote it, Phil Zimmerman, he got into all sorts of trouble because he was producing crypto, which was at the time again, was the purview of NSA, and it was considered, or it was classified the same as weapons. It was, cons it was consider considered to be materiel, and it had to be protected as such, and you couldn't export it to other countries. And so there was all sorts of political issues sort of at, a pu at the public level. Um, internally, we ran into a problem because one of our customers, which might have been a branch of the military, who had uh, negotiated a multi-million dollar contract for some new crypto, for some new secure communications devices, uh, wanted to cancel the contract because they're like, well, there's this PGP thing and it's free. Why don't we just use that? Um, so there was a day at NSA, you know, in our little, our little bubble there up in, Fort Me uh, uh, up in Phoenix, where the word went out, all hands on deck. We need to find an attack against PGP. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details uh, of the attack against PGP, but I will say that there was a couple guys that came up with an attack, and it involved uh, emailing uh, a target, and it involved an attachment, 
and it, and it required somebody to receive the email and open the attachment. Does that sound familiar? That was probably 95, so I don't know how old you think phishing is, but it's been around for a long, long time. Um, my little anecdote, why, and, you know, catch me later and buy me a drink, I'll tell you more of the story, but these guys that came up with this attack, they went they won all sorts of awards. I got 500 bucks for mine. They got thousands of dollars because they had saved NSA. They had saved InfoSec. And they, they sort of did a, a dog and pony show. They were paraded around. And, and they did uh, you know, presentations of, the, of the, the attack that they had done. And it was a pretty cool attack once you got down to what they were doing. Uh, months later, they were doing a brown bag lunch back in the offices just for you know, their peers. And I went to hear what they had done. And as they described it, I said, well, that sounds very interesting, but wouldn't that same technique work against our own crypto? And they stopped and paused, and they said, hmm, yeah. I'm like, then what's the big deal? And they're like, well, we weren't, we weren't tasked with finding attacks against ours. So anyway, <laughs> politics. I mentioned that what we were doing was top secret. Uh, anything that we applied uh, had to be classified to the level of the target. Uh, and that uh, uh, became very problematic, not only because of the time it took to get the permissions, but what we were doing that was considered to be uh, classified. And one of the criteria, that, and we were talking to the general counsel, the lawyers at this point, and one of the criteria that they came back with was they said, look, if you're doing something against a target system, you're attacking it. And A, that's not something that we do, but there's ways around it. You know, we can go through the hoops and the bureaucracy and get you there. Um, but if it's, a, if, if it's an active attack, if you're going after something, there's this whole rigmarole, as I described earlier, take weeks and months to get permission to do it. So I am going to share with you a top secret now, uh, because it might have been something that was used against a classified system. And you ready to see an attack tool? Can you understand why we got a little bit frustrated? <laughs> they, they ruled, the, the, the lawyers said, because the ping command elicited a response from the target that was classified as an active attack. So for us to just simply ping a target system, that would have gone through, if we'd have done it this way, you know, a three, four, five, six week process of getting permissions before we could issue the command. Now you understand the ping command is a, a Unix system command. Everybody in the world that had a Unix box had access to it. But we weren't allowed to use it unless we had all these permissions. So what that meant was we decided we needed to talk to the lawyers. And for some reason, I felt like I could converse with lawyers. So I sort of took that on as, as my sort of side project. Other guys were better at sort of the technology and digging into things and, and breaking things. I always felt like I was a business major. Techn technically, I was, I was more able to converse with other people and, and, and sort of speak in different languages and try to translate and, and be a mediator. So I took on the, the role of, of, of trying to explain to the lawyers what we were doing. The premise was, and they were trying to be flexible, and they were, they were feeling the pressure of all the rules and everything and wanting to be responsive to us. We were their customer in this instance, but their customer was also you know, the NSA itself, the senior level management, the country, and all that kind of stuff. But they came up with the idea of, well, why don't you just tell us what all the different tools and functions and, and applications and things are, and we'll sort of evaluate them one at a time, and we can pre-approve them. So then when you get a job, you can just sit, you know, sort of a la carte say, we're going to do this, 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 and this. You've seen them all before, pre-approved them, you're good to go. And that was the idea of streamlining the process. What I tried to teach them was a so much of these attacks that we were doing was just basic functionality and features of the operating systems and, and the applications running on the operating systems there was really nothing fancy about it and um, it was it had much more to do with the methodology you know we didn't know what we were going to run into until we did some of the things that you said we can't do until we tell you exactly what we're going to do so some sort of a cart before the horse type of thing um, popular show at the time was called Home Improvement, and they had a sub-segment in that show called Tool Time. Anybody remember Tool Time, Home Improvement? That's what we called it. I used to spend once a week with the lawyers, and we'd sit down at a computer terminal, and I would, sh I would basically teach them the Unix operating system and what you could do with it. You know, fun with fi file permissions, fun with the set UID scripts, fun with, 
you know, making things hiccup and do different things. And, and usually I would do things at the time, and this is where, if only I had time to tell more stories, I would usually abuse him in some way, like I'd set something up so that the next time he came back, I had been on his system for a week and had had time to dig through and find all sorts of neat things because there were no, no rules at the time, and it was meant to be an educational process. Um, word got out. Uh, you know, we were doing this stuff primarily for the military and the classified networks, but uh, people were hearing about, hey, NSA is doing this pen testing, finding the vulnerability of systems, you know, figuring out if you're secure when you're connecting to the internet. Um, uh, one of the members of the pit, after my departure, sent me a copy of this article. It technically came out in 98, which is after I left. And I'm sorry, there's not a more sexy way of, of showing this to you, but it basically talks about in this article how NSA is doing all these pen tests and they're doing it for all sorts of people that are, are unclassified networks and that's what NSA, not what NSA is supposed to do. That's the purview of NIST. Back then NIST was a joke. They always came to NSA for any kind of technical expertise, especially at a you know, pen testing level. Um, and this is really bad because NSA is really powerful, yada, yada, yada. Um, this is a, a letter that came into us during my time, and it came from the Attorney General um, asking for help to do a penetration test. Unclassified network. Um, we, I was working with the lawyers. You can see my name's up there. Uh, I'm sorry, not yet. My name's on the response back saying, yeah, we're going to do it, and, and Jeff Mann will be your point of contact. I was working with the lawyers. I was working with NIST. I was working with another organization called DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency, because there was all sorts of hoops to jump through. It was about a two or three month long process to try to get all the signatures and all, you know, follow all the rules and protocols. And NIST had to, you know, there had to be this formal request that came from um, the Department of Justice, from the Attorney General. It had to be cabinet level, uh, and so on and so forth. And while all this is going on, uh, the DOJ website got hacked. This is one of the first breaches. Um, this is sort of a completely another story, uh, but just the highlights are it happened. Uh, I organized a team to go down and, and we learned how to do forensics. Of course, forensics had never been done before. And uh, one of the upshots of that was, uh, you know, after I left NSA, I got involved with the SANS Institute and knew a couple of the early people that ran that. And they put together some, some uh, guidance documents and one of them had to do with how do you handle incidents you know what's incident response so i was one of the contributing editors or whatever to that thing um i have a whole lot more stories my time is limited uh, hopefully i've just tried to paint a picture of what it was like at the beginning i'm not saying we were the best we just happened to be the first we had to blaze the trail because we had to rewrite the rules that had never been written before i think it took a loose cannon to do that um, but many of us me in particular because i was the the spearhead, the project leader for that DOJ thing, have the, the scars in our backs to prove it. Um, but a lot of us left. You know, four out of the six uh, went into the private sector. Um, I mentioned in the book what I showed you earlier, June 9th to 13th, 1997, is when eligible receiver happened. Um, the, the shot here is, is a book review of that book I was showing you. Again, it mentions the pit and the NSA and everything. Uh, on the more or less the 20th anniversary of eligible receiver, there was a symposium held at the University of Maryland University College where they brought a, together a bunch of the, 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 the mucky mucks, the suits that had planned eligible receiver, and they talked about it. And um, they must have gotten in trouble because when they first pu put this up, they had a video of the whole day-long symposium, and one of the sessions was a discussion of eligible receiver. And they actually declassified a video that had been done shortly after eligible receiver by the people that did it that talked about it. It was a 25-minute video. By the time they got done redacting it, it was down to 11 minutes. And it was up on the web for a while. It wasn't advertised, but if you knew exactly where to go to find it, you could find a, a copy of the symposium and a copy of this redacted uh, video that talks about it. Um, if you go to this website now, it, it, on that website, says, you know, email this guy and he'll tell you how you can view the videos. So they took them down, but, but they're still technically unclassified. But for some reason, NSA doesn't want to, you know, just publicize this stuff and put it out there. But it's been on the web. It might still be out there. I haven't had time to look for it. Um, 
put things further in context, my last date, anybody have a guess for this one? This is when NMAP was released. We didn't even have NMAP at the time. Uh, the pit still gets together about once or twice a year. Sometimes the guys that work at NSA bring us gifts. So there's secret sauce that you can get. Uh, a little special light pen that flashes the NSA seal. All these things are available at the gift shop at the National Cryptologic Museum, which is in Fort Meade, Maryland. Highly encourage you to visit it if you ever make it to the DC, Baltimore area. Um, if you wanna hear more stories, certainly seek me out and find me. I'm on Security Weekly, if you've ever watched Paul or listened to Paul's Security Weekly. Uh, I'm considered a Jedi master because I think I know how to talk to people. Um, I became a member of the Curmudgeons Club uh, last year. The guy in the middle there is Gene Spaffer, author of the Bible, the first book on internet security. Uh, I'm over there on the right side. The guy who I have my hand around, my arm around, is actually the lawyer that I worked with and tried to educate about pen testing back in the day. We hadn't talked for about 20 years, but we buried the hatchet and we're good friends now. You might recognize that bearded guy in the middle there. Uh, the woman next to me, Becky Bass, I don't know if you've heard of Becky Bass. She passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, she was our den mother. We called her mom. She was our InfoSec mom. And she was behind the scenes talking to NSA management saying, you gotta let these kids do their thing. You gotta let the pit exist. This is something we need to do. Um, shout out to Freaker Life. Oh, yeah. I'm one of the anachronisms in a Freaker Life deck. Dave Schwartzberg's here. He can show you the deck. Um, I am the pit boss, but I'm not really the boss of the pit. Pits in quotes. No, bosses in quotes. Uh, questions, comments, I think time's up, so see me outside. How much time do we have left? Three minutes, if anybody has any questions. I can field any questions, and I probably can't answer it anyway. Anyway. Yes. Great movie. Yeah, because the bad guy was like the deputy director. I mean, that was a real position. Uh, to me, the funniest scene in the movie is they have a scene where he's coming to work and he's in a big stretch black limousine, darkened windows, and they're driving down a ramp underneath one of those weird glass buildings. I mean, that was all real, except for that's like how they got down to the loading dock to deliver food to the cafeteria. Maybe during warfare they might bring in the, the executives that way, but not, not really. Yes, sir? Uh, interesting. We, we were using SunOS. My recollection was it was 4.2, 2.4. We actually owned source code for SunOS, which cost like millions of dollars back in the day. Again, it was before Linux. It was before open source uh, software. So we, we felt very privileged to have access to source code. Uh, we used to debate whether it was, you know, BSD or System 5 was better, but that's, you know, Linux. Yes? I have thoughts, but I don't have time, and that's best served over a drink. <laughs> What's the t-shirt going around? Crypto means cryptography, not Bitcoin, or uh, blockchain? Yes, sir. I've considered it, I'm lazy. A book seems like kind of hard to do. I've done a book forward. Uh, there is a book that's supposedly coming out sometime where I did a chapter, but it was more like I filled out a questionnaire and somebody in the community is trying to put together a compilation of people, different people telling war stories. Maybe someday I will. If you, would you guys read a book about this? Because I'd probably, I'd probably get arrested if I wrote it, I don't know. Yes sir, last question. Yes. <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> uh, I think time's up. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, email. You can call me. I probably won't answer. Uh, but thank you very much. <laughs>